finished today, and as you can see there, we're in chapters 11 and 12. Uh, last week we uh, looked at Hebrews 10 19. The writer of Hebrews has been uh, making argumentation really from the beginning of the letter. And we remind ourselves as we look at Hebrews that it is a sermon. In uh, chapter 13 and verse 22, he calls it a word of exhortation. The style uh, would be what, would they, what they would call rhetorical, where it uses rhetoric, it, it, um, its construction is just like a sermon would be. And so, uh, as a preacher might be wont to do, he makes several points and arguments. And now he's making the application. That's where we are. Actually, going back to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19, he makes a twofold uh, statement that's, that begins since. Um, since we have this confidence, let us draw near. And, and since we have a high priest of the house of God, that's the longest argument of the book. From Hebrews 5 to Hebrews 10 is that Christ in Christianity is better than anything else because you have a better high priest. And what we had seen in that is, is that the high priest is better because of the priest himself, because of the place where he offers, and then because of the nature of the sacrifice. That's the last thing that he says and then he transitions. So the point is, in all of this, that he has said, and that's kind of the way he's going to talk, is because all of these things are true, what should that mean to you and me as we live every day? So he is going to go through a series of exhortations, urging us, calling us uh, to do several things. He's going to make some warnings. And here's something else with that sermon, and you'll think about this when you hear preaching. Now, no matter what the subject is, if someone is approaching that in a way that reflects what Scripture calls for the preacher to do. You know, you think about Ephesians 4.15, speak the truth in love. 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26, talks about the demeanor of somebody who's sharing the gospel. Sometimes the subject at hand is very negative. You heard a sermon on hell. If you hear a lesson on some negative and difficult subject, we ought to do like they did in the Bible and offer a measure of hope. It should be blunted. It should be tempered by a, a positive, an encouragement. And that's what the writer of Hebrews does as he goes all the way through this sermon. He says, there is a consequence if you turn away. There have been individuals who have turned away. And this is where they stand as they are right now. And there's some very, very strong, and we would say some negative language in Hebrews. But you'll always find the writer... The, the preacher, if you will, coming back to the positive. Uh, and if you'll look at Hebrews 13, that's how he ends. He says, I hope you can bear with this word of exhortation. And, and he gives some final charges, and I'm saying this because we probably won't get to Hebrews 13, that it's just a, a, a several encouragements for them to, to hang on because it's worth it. And really, whatever the subject is, that's what we're driving at. Now... As we get to our material today, we're going to, to step back in our mind a couple of verses because he's making a transition. And these first three or four minutes is kind of a review of where we were last week that he introduces the subject of faith in Hebrews chapter 10 in verse 38. And what we're going to call this section, and this is going to take us from Hebrews 11.1 1, through Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 29. As we look at this, we call this from the valley of faith to the mountain of victory. And we call it that because even though faith uh, is one of those positive themes, sometimes we have to hang on to faith and we're experiencing faith in very difficult times. The writer is going to bring up all these different examples to us and these examples of individuals who had to rely on their faith were not necessarily living at the best times. Some of them were. Some of them were struggling. Some of them lived in times when the people uh, in the, on the whole were, were not at all interested in what God had to say or following Him. But no matter what, they were in that valley and they came out of that valley through faith. And we're going to end with a very spectacular picture of uh, using Mount Sinai as an example of the mountain of victory that God wants us to have. And, it, and that contrast is going to paint a picture all of this, really the whole letter, but especially what we go through today, all of this is going to be pointing to the idea that the writer's doing everything he can to get these folks who haven't let go yet to hang on to their faith. 
Now, with uh, that, I want us to just notice three points in class today. We'll divide the material into three sections. The first point or first section is all of Hebrews chapter 11. And it's the idea that God has provided something better for us. That's verse 1 through 40. That kind of mirrors what the entire letter is trying to tell us. But he's going to do this by introducing faith to us. So as we walk through chapter 11, all of this centers around faith. And the first thing that he does, as we saw last week, is he makes an explanation of faith. If I were just to ask you, and if you already opened up your Bible, that's fine, but just to look me in the eyeballs, uh, define faith for me. Just knee jerk. What's faith? The substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Hey, where does that come from? Right here, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. And so the writer, has, he steps back for a moment to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 38. And after having given those encouragements of all that we have, and, and don't sin willfully and turn away from that because there's this great punishment that awaits those who give up their, their, uh, their faithfulness to God and they go back to the world. For these uh, people, it's going back to Judaism. That's what they had been converted from. That's what Hebrews is. It's, it's talking to Jewish people. And they're, they're tempted to go back to that. But whatever it is, what he's saying is there's a great price. So don't you let that happen to you. And so in Hebrews 10 and verse 38, he quotes Habakkuk. You know, this is uh, one of the most quoted, uh, most diversely quoted Old Testament passages. It's probably one of two verses that you know from Habakkuk 2. Uh, from the book of Habakkuk, really. Habakkuk 2 and verse 20. We sometimes used to sing this. I don't know that I've ever heard us sing this here. The Lord is in His holy temple. Now that tells you something. I'm going to talk about how singing helps us to know God's Word tonight. Um, you know that, maybe because you're an expert on Habakkuk, but probably because you've sung it. How many of you have sung that before? It used to be the song with which we start worship, right? The Lord is in His holy temple, at least when I was growing up. So that's one passage you know. The other one is Habakkuk 2 and verse 4. The just shall live by faith. All right, so that's first said in the context where here's a prophet who is wondering, why is the more righteous people, the uh, people of, of Judah, why are they suffering at the hands of a more wicked enemy, the Babylonians? Why are we not as bad as the other guys and yet you're using the other guys to punish us. That's really the struggle that Habakkuk is having. Now, why is that a wise passage for the Hebrews writer to bring up here? Why bring up a passage that would make people, if, they, if they're Jews, and they know the book of Habakkuk, and they know that that's the message of Habakkuk, what relevance would that have to these Christians? Why are we the Jews being punished and not the Gentiles? Okay, it could be. Why are we the Jews uh, and not the Gentiles being punished? The Roman Empire is Gentile, and so they're in charge. I think that's an answer. How about more directly and more timelessly? What also were these Jews in the book of Hebrews? Would you... They're, okay, so why are the Christians being punished? And especially not the Jews, but the non-Christians. Have you, have you ever wondered why, when you're trying to do it the right way, that you struggle and that it costs you and that you pay some price that those... You know, we sing that song sometimes, don't we? Tempted and tried, we're oft made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long. You know, while there are others living about us, never molested, never hurt, though in the wrong. I think that the folks that are reading this letter from this writer are maybe thinking the, those thoughts, if not singing that song. And so he brings up the subject of faith, and he says, don't shrink back. Don't let go of your faith. And so what he's going to do now is he is going to take people who know the Old Testament, and he is going to walk them through several examples. We see other places in the New Testament where preachers will use the entire Old Testament in order to make their point. Does anybody come to mind? Okay, Paul in Acts chapter 13 would be an example. How about somebody else who it didn't turn out so well? Stephen. I mean, it's a history lesson with a very pointed bottom line that you're just like your, your uh, headstrong, hard-hearted forefathers. They resisted the prophets. You resist the voice of, of God through uh, Christ and his, his spokesman, and it cost him his life. 
Now, the Hebrews writer is going to walk through history, he really does. Um, is comprehensive. He's not just focusing on Judaism. That is the time when Moses uh, is in charge and we have the law of Moses. He's going to go back behind that. And through all of that, he is going to give us a history lesson on faith. Now, I know this is very familiar material. It's probably what you know the best in Hebrew. So we're not going to go through verse by verse. After he makes this explanation of faith, and by the way, here's a passage that you're probably familiar with. Without faith... It's impossible to what? Please God. Why? You know the second part? He that comes to God must what? Believe that He is and that He's a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. All right, so there's the setup. Here's an explanation of faith. It is based on substance. It's based on evidence, but it's hope in the unseen. And we're going to see how we've got to have it if we're going to make it. And that's very key to what he's saying here. Now... We also saw the fact that he gives several examples of faith. Twenty individuals and twenty uh, groups that we are, are given uh, to, to see and to understand something about. Uh, and if you'll remember, if you were in here last week, we said, this is the roll call of the who's who of the Old Testament. If it was a, a uh, hero, somebody that you associate with faithfulness in the Old Testament, you're going to find them. In this list, by and large, I, I, I don't know who I'm missing, but on the whole, you have just a roll call of the greatest of the faithful of the Old Testament. And it's remarkable, and it's yet not surprising. What is surprising is that there are others in this uh, list that we really scratch our heads to wonder how they made it. Um, and what we mentioned last week was that in this number, it, you can go kind of toward the last part of the chapter. Who's surprising in this list? Rahab first. Let's deal with her. Why is it amazing that Rahab is in here? There's what she did for a living. She was a prostitute, a harlot. That's not all. She's a Gentile. She is an inhabitant of Jericho, one of the Canaanite cities that the Jews were to overthrow. Any other reason? She lied. So, brethren... Follow the example of the lying prostitute who was a Gentile. Well, we understand that, right? We've talked about that on, on other occasions. Those were not the things that she was lauded for, and it's certainly not just unique to her, but despite the, the background that she had and despite the, the, the moral issues she was struggling with, and keep that in mind with all of these, that she was struggling with these things in the midst of her own um, need for moral growth, what do we see in her life? I mean, what makes her remarkable? What makes her stand out among all the other folks in Jericho? Hey, by the way, how do the people in Jericho, how do they feel about these coming Jews? What's their disposition? Do you remember? Well, I think she saw what we understand that our faith is only possible because we realize God is faithful. Absolutely. And she's... So that's connected to this. Think about all the other folks in Jericho. How do they feel knowing that this army has crossed the Jordan River and is there? Are they pretty confident in themselves? They're afraid. They're trembling. Rahab is too. The difference is they just hold up in the city. They prepare. And Rahab... Now, there's some providence involved. These spies come, and we could talk all about this. We don't, that's not the point of this lesson as to why they were there and what they were doing. But there, she takes advantage of this with her faith to say, make this promise to me. Protect me, and I'll protect you. And a faith in God's ability to do what's impossible in the eyes of men causes her to go against her entire society and to make a decision to stand with God's people. And as a result of that, she becomes a part of God's people. I think the Hebrews writer is doing a lot with that. Now you go to the next verse, and who are some other surprising people? Hey, if, you were to, if you were to say, what's the worst overall period of Old Testament history? What would you say? The, the period of the judges. Why? Why is that so bad? Okay, there's the key of the verse. It's, at, it's bookends at the end of the book of Judges. Judges 17, 6 and Judges 21, 25. Uh, in those days there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. 
All right, so in between that, you have one of the most egregious, terrible things that you'll ever read in the Bible. It is worse than Sodom and Gomorrah in that four chapters. And yet, it's characterized on the front end and the back end by saying that's how they were. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And there are four judges. Now, most of the judges, a lot of the judges, we don't know a lot about. Abimelech wasn't a judge. He was a usurper. He was a wicked guy. But let's think about the ones that do make the list. Who makes the list? Samson. Sam, okay, let's leave him for last. He's at the end of that list. But who's before Samson? Gideon? Gideon? Barak? Jephthah. All right, Gideon. What you know about Gideon? He, he hid in the threshing floor. He was hiding his wheat from um, their oppressors. I can't remember now if it's the Ammonites or the Midianites. You can look in, uh, in Midianites. And as a result of that, he's, he's not even, he doesn't even want to show his face in the light of day. And a lot of his brethren, their Jews, are worshiping idols. And he knocks it down. And they're going, they want to kill him. And his dad comes out and says, hey, if this God is really as powerful as you're trusting in him to be, he'll take care of Gideon. Anyway, Gideon comes from idolatry, even though he's a Jew. They've fallen away from God. They're doing what's right in their own eyes. And Gideon is so courageous, isn't he? I mean, how many times do you have to ask God, do this to the fleece, and then I believe. I know you sent me. And then he says about himself, I'm the least. Uh, our family's the least in all Israel and in our tribe, and I'm, our family's the least of that tribe. And God says, go, you valiant warrior. God saw in him when he didn't see in himself. So you have with each of these. And Gideon is not going to be so great at the end. We talk about Rahab on the front end. Gideon on the back end struggles with the idolatry and the sinfulness of their times. So one by one, he mentions these judges. Barak, remember we said about him last week? What is it about Barak? Who do you know in the story of Barak? And a lot of you are going, Barak, Barak, that's in the Bible. It's not Barak, is it? You know, it's about the same way. Deborah. Who wins the victory? Deborah. Whose song do we sing? The song of Barak? No, the song of Deborah. Not us, but the the Jews did. Um, And so you have him saying, I'll go only if you go. And yet, he he believes and he does go. How about Jephthah? Makes a rash vow. First thing comes out of my house, I'll give it to God. Oops. Oops. Had only one child. It was a daughter. That's who comes out. Whatever happens to her, if he actually sacrifices her, which is what he says he's going to do, or she's perpetually a virgin, either one, let's don't split hairs over that. Either way, his line is dead. He's not going to have grandchildren. Um, and, and he's also, he's the son of a harlot. He's got all kind of issues in his background. And then Samson. How does Samson make this list? When you think of Samson, what else do you think of? Samson and Delilah. And it's just, it's just the most pronounced example of a pattern in Samson's life. Samson is a Nazarite. How does he do with that vow? Breaks it repeatedly, right? He, he's got a weakness for women, and it's going to literally cost him his life. So why does he make this list? Okay. Because in the end, he called on God to save him. Now, perhaps someone might like to make an application to something like deathbed repentance. First of all, we remind ourselves, this is a different covenant. This is not the covenant of Christ. That's not what this is about. This is about the weakness of the time. Somebody who had struggled with faith. And by the way, the Spirit of the Lord is on him throughout uh, some of these things. God's with him. He's serving God faithfully. He's destroying the enemy. That's the work he was sent to do. But he's doing so through a pattern of falling and weakness. And then in the end, he says, God, give me my... I mean, he's asking for the impossible. He's lost his eyesight. He's lost his strength. And he says, God, avenge me on my enemies. And and the Bible says that he he killed more in his death than he did in his life. That's pretty impressive because of what he did in his life. But why? Do you get why Abraham's in this list of Old Testament heroes? Do, Do you get why even David, despite what we talked about last week, why David would be here? Moses, the most humble man on earth... So why lump them all together, do you think? What does it accomplish? 
Yes, a promise that was not delivered. It was not yet fulfilled. Now, how does that apply to us? Mr. Dolores said they all lived and they sought and they served and they had faith even though they died before what was promised was fulfilled. Okay, so there's the heart of it right there. If you didn't hear, they all made mistakes along the way as we did. Sometimes, you know, when we talk about in the New Testament, who do you relate to among the apostles? It's amazing to me how many people say this. You know what most people say? Peter. Peter. How many of you think you're like Peter? I mean, a lot of us, do. oh, you know, nobody wants to answer that. Um, you know, you, you, you talk before you think, you know, you, you, uh, maybe you, you get out over your skis a little bit, and I, I'll never, Father, I, Lord, I'll never betray you, and next thing you know, it's only been a few minutes, and there you are. Um, but who do you relate to in Hebrews 11? Or have you ever even thought about it in that way? Maybe if you were to make an in-depth study of all these folks and compared it to your life, maybe it would help you to, to, to kind of form some kind of thought about that. But you know, here's what I think the Hebrews writer is saying. Are you an Abraham? Man, maybe you are, are known for your faith on your job, at, at school, in your neighborhood, wherever you are. People know that you are a Christian and that you're faithful. You know what else they know if they've spent any time around you? You've got problems. You struggle. You have weaknesses. You have areas. You've lost your temper. You Maybe you, you've told a lie. Maybe you participated in gossiping about a, a co-worker or a schoolmate. Uh, you, maybe maybe you know, you've, you, there's an event that they can remember that, boy, you're sorry for, and you've really tried to put that behind you, but they know it's not characteristic of you, but it's, it's something that you've done. Or maybe you're a Samson. Maybe you're somebody who is always having to pick yourself up because despite your best efforts, you find yourself slipping and falling. Now, you're not hearing in this because I'm not saying this, that God is endorsing for you to just live uh, serving your flesh and serving sin all along the way. Just make sure that you have a few moments at the end where you can make things right with God. That's not, I don't believe that's what the, the writer of Hebrews is doing. What he's doing is saying, we all, every one of us, are in, in some way sh striving to be faithful. And, and maybe our light's shining brighter. Maybe we're trying to, to really build up that light. But we're doing so struggling. Either way, what he's saying is don't give up trust. Keep, keep serving. Keep investing faith. Because you may die before the Lord comes again. You, 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 may, you may die having not seen the promise fulfilled, but you know because of the cross of Calvary, that the victory has been won and you're just waiting for that, same as those folks did. So I really do think this is powerful to those examples. Anything else before we move on? That three minutes is 20 minutes. Sorry about that. All right. Now um, let's get a, uh, move ahead here. Let's see the exertion of faith. Now this is probably something else you've seen when you study Hebrews chapter 11. When we talk about the kind of faith that exists, that is being uh, held up by the writer. What do we say about that faith? What do you, what's the common thread that the faith of these people all have with one another? Okay, that's it, Tom. Activity. Right? How, how many of you have heard that point made? It, it's not mental assent. It's not just an acknowledgement. I believe. I trust. As you walk through each of these examples, what you see is accompanying action. That, that faith leads them to do something, right? No matter who it is, there's something attached to their faith that demonstrates. You know, you know, James is making a completely different point than the Hebrews writer, but he's the one that tells us that faith without works is dead. Why? Being alone, right? And so we've got to have a faith that's beyond that demonic faith of just believing. It's got to be a faith that does. And so he walks through all of that. But here's something I want you to think about regarding the kinds of things that they did. What's so remarkable about what Noah did? Why is, why is Noah held up for us? What did he do? 
he, he was faithful, but what, did, what was that work? What was the work he did? He built an ark. And what's so remarkable about that? We know for sure he hadn't seen a global flood. Now, let me, let me, let me just take this out of the, the realm of and, uh, the discussion of the rain that, that he uh, had not uh, seen. Suppose that it worked this way today. And God were to cleave the skies and were to speak to one of us and say, I want you to build an ark because I'm going to flood the entire earth. What do you think the, the reaction of people today would be? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, makes sense to me. I mean, now the one difference is, is they would know, at least on some level, whether they would choose to believe it as truth or uh, as allegory or myth, that there, this kind of thing has been discussed as having happened before. So we'd ha still have an advantage. But do you think you'd get too many people to jump on board with you? I mean, I hope. We'd have a pretty good little group compared to what happened on that day. But God's telling him without any kind of an understanding or anything to correlate it to that I want you to build this ark because this is happening. So it's not just action. It's action that's really hard to accept could happen. What about Moses? What, what's so remarkable about what he did? What's his task? I mean, and, and the, by the way, the Hebrews writer gives a lot of ink or a lot of scroll pen or whatever to, to him. What did he do? What was his role? Okay, first he, he stood up to Pharaoh. Don't, don't just gloss over that. This is the... So it would be like today, you're in some rogue nation. Let me think, think about current events. And you're going to go to the president of the United States, the superpower of the world, and say... You know, I have a list of demands, and there, you, there's no negotiating. It's got to be line by line exactly what I said. I, I, see, I see your nuclear arsenal. I see your army, your navy, your air force, your marine. I don't care. You've got to do this because my God told me. I, I'd just love to see the, how they would report that in the news, right? If it ever even made it that far. What else? See, that's not even it. Okay, yeah. So, so it's even beyond the president. They think he's deity. That's a good, good point. Is there anything else that Moses has got to, to, to do in faith that's pretty remarkable? I bet you we'd all pause to do it. To move, to move, to, yeah, to move all those people, what's the first step to move them? Where you, what do you got to move them through? The Red Sea. All right. Put yourself there one night. You got one night to get um, 600,000 men plus their families, a couple of million, three million people. The, now, the, the, the ground's dry. God made sure that happened so that they could get through in one night. I want you to see yourself walking through that and looking up. I don't know how high the waters were. Let's say they were 20 feet. You could see all the aquatic and sea life. You can see, you could hear maybe the rush of the water. It's a sea. And you're walking through that. Oh, and were they, were they eager to do that? It's only because the Egyptians are coming. It's kind of like, pick your poison. They got, they got spears. We, at least we have a chance. The, wa the water is up. And Moses, in his faith, the writer says, leads them through the Red Sea. Now let me give you just two more examples. Rahab. What was so incredible about her work and her faith? You've already mentioned it on some level. Who was she? She's a Gentile. And here's a people that are desert nomads. And now they're coming into the land. And in the word, they've had some victories on the other side there. Bashan and Og, they've beat a few people. And so the word has preceded them. But here she is in the impregnable fortress known as Jericho. Um, and she believes that this rogue people is powerful or has a God powerful enough to defeat them. She also had to believe that they keep their word. Okay, so there's, she's got to act in hiding them that they're going to keep their word, which they, they, they vow to her. They say you, there's certain conditions. You've got to meet that. But now I want you to think about when the week of the battle arrives, 
Is it hard for her to retain faith? Uh, by the way, what's, uh, what's the weapons of war that those ferocious Israelites are carrying into battle? Trumpets, but not just trumpets. Pitchers and voices. Now here's Rahab saying, this is the plan. But what does she do? She stays where she is and she believes. One more example. Gideon. You know, we already talked about his fearfulness. What's his task? The Midianites and the Amalekites. They've they've come together. Anybody know how many there were of them? 120,000 plus 15,000 more he's going to have to defeat after that. How's he doing as far as his army's concerned? Well, no, I mean, to start off with, you got five figures. 10,000 go home because they're afraid. God says, whittle it down. There's too many. Why does it have to be a small number? What does God say to Gideon? If, if it's a big force going up, even against, I mean, a, a force over 10 times your size, what's still going to be the outcome? That's it. That's it. The whole point is not about us, it's about him. When you're called to do something, will it always make sense? Can you think of things that we're asked to do as children of God, as the people of God, that flies against what we would think? So here's the caveat Scripture gives us. If you don't understand it, if you don't like it, you don't have to do it, right? That's the kind of faith that the Hebrews writer is holding up. It's audacious sometimes. Sometimes some of the things that are are taught are are in the, the minority of religion. Sometimes the example we give is baptism. Does it make any earthly sense? That the blood of Christ is applied to our sins through imitating the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? To a lot of people, it doesn't. But even what God calls us to do as Christians, there are going to be times when we go, I just don't get it. I don't think it should be that way. I I mean, what is there? The people around me, they don't believe that that's the answer. So don't... Don't just relegate, I guess what I'm saying is don't just relegate this to the Old Testament and things that they were going through. The writer of Hebrews is saying, it's going on right now. And not just in the first century, it's going on for us. And it will be as long as the earth will stand. That God's going to ask us to exert our faith even when it doesn't make sense. Now, that's right. Well, and, and, and certainly... That's what the writer is doing to drive home, that faith needs to be accompanied by actions that are dictated or directed from, however you want to say that, from God. It's his plan. We're following his plan. It's not what we want to do. That's right. And it, but it puts us to the test. We've got to trust that, that he's faithful. Um, he warns of the expense of faith. I think you can already see that faith is not always rose and sunshine. Sometimes it costs. So I want you to think about this. What did it cost the people mentioned in this chapter? Did faith cost anybody in this chapter? Give me some specific answers. Who's the first one it costs? It's an open book test. You can look right down. Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 4. Abel. What did it cost Abel? Incidentally, not the doing of it, but all the factors surrounding that, he simply did what God told him to do. Cain brings something of his, out of his own mind, and as the result of this, Abel loses his life. Is he the only one that loses? I mean, it's remarkable to me that there's a pattern of discussion that faith costs. Faith exerts, it does, but it also costs. Who else? Look at, look at about verse uh, 25 through 27. What about Moses? What did it cost Moses to be faithful? Okay, because of his own disobedience, so that's really a lapse of faith. He's going to lose the land of promise. But the Hebrews writer is going to use him in a positive sense. He pays the price for doing something right. He 
he had every advantage. He had the best education. He was, had all the wealth of the most powerful man on earth. But he forsook that, the pleasures of sin for a season, in, in order to do what? To, to endure affliction with the people of God. Man, the application is just right there in our faces because that's a challenge for us. So the faith cost them comfort and enjoyment and pleasure on occasions. And here's a guy who had it all, and he risked it all because of faith. But really, if you go down to verse 35 through 38, and we don't have time uh, to read that, but I want you to notice how the writer rattles off at the very end before he makes his final point. He says that faith led some to be tortured, mocked, scourged, chained, imprisoned, stoned, sawn in two. Some people believe that was what happened to Isaiah. Tempted, put to death by the sword, made destitute, afflicted, and made nomads. Now why say that to a people that you're saying, hey, don't let go of your faith. It's going to be worth it in the end. You, oh, you might be cut in two, but other than that, you know, it's going to be just fine. Why do that? Yes, he's going to point us ahead. But he doesn't, want to, he doesn't want to give you some false illusion. And God doesn't want us. One of the challenges when we're trying to, to teach somebody about Christ and we're trying to lead them to Christ is that we can find ourselves, as we should, pointing out the blessings and the promises and the hope. But when Jesus was discipling people, he said, if any man will come after me, what has he got to do? Deny himself, take up his cross, how often? Daily, and follow me. Follow me? Uh, if I'm going to walk behind Jesus, where did Jesus wind up? No, not wind up, but where was one of the last stops on the road? Cross. Calvary. Now, ultimately, there's victory after that. You know, it'd be nice if we could just talk about all the blessings in Christ, but sometimes there's an expense but we compare that, and that's what the writer's going to do when we get into chapter 12. We compare that to the price that Jesus paid so that after all of that's over, we can get what was promised, what they're anticipating. All right? Now, what might Christianity cost them? If you want to write in your notes, go back to chapter 10, verse 32. There's the price that they had paid in the past. Maybe their property was taken away. They suffered ill treatment. They were embarrassed, humiliated. Um, when they were first Christians, they were willing to pay that price. Or you can also write uh, Hebrews 12, 4 and following. We'll get there in just a minute. He says, you've not yet resisted the blood. You, you're not done. There may be more uh, prices to pay in the future. It, it, as you grow in your faith and you get stronger in your relationship with God, there'll be more tests ahead. Um, and so, but more importantly, if and when faith costs us, Will we hang on to faith? I think that's what the writer's saying. And then he reveals the expectation of faith. And that is hope. Hope is confident expectation. He's trying to encourage them in the, in the overall. What can they expect if they hang on to faith? He had begun by saying back in chapter 10 and verse 36, when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. He says faith will be to the preserving of your soul, Hebrews 10 and verse 39. But uh, let me just leave this exercise with you. If you read through that list again, what did these folks who sh had faith, even when it cost them, what did they get? I mean, there's another way to look at this chapter. I mean, let me just start you out. The men of old gained approval, verse 2. Abel, he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, verse 4. Enoch obtained a witness that he was pleasing to God. And if you go all the way down the chapter and look at every one of the examples, there is a blessing that comes because they exerted the faith, even when it was difficult, and even though they had to go through some pretty gnarly things along the way, that's what happens in the end. And here's the bottom line of chapter 11. All of these gained approval through their faith. What does that tell you when you see that? Here you are, tasked with having faith which requires you to do the things that accompany faith. That's going to cost you in some way. There's a hope that you have that's captured right here in verse 39. What does that mean? All these gained approval through their faith for you and me. When you anticipate that. When you expect that. Yes, Harold.
Right? That's a good answer. There, there's there's a, tangible, a tangible result in this life. Right? There's the peace that passes all understanding. There's all the blessings in Christ that's sustaining us and helping us to go through the difficult. Do you think that's what this is talking about? Is there something maybe more than that? Let, let me ask you on the most basic level. Why are you here today? Why are you a follower of Christ? Why do you strive to hold on to your faith and to trust Him even when it's hard to do so? Why are you doing that? That's it. So the Hebrews writer says, let's walk through 4,000 years of history for a moment. And the bottom line is, don't let go of this. Because at the end of this, no matter how ugly some of the moments are going to be, you are going to be sustained by the blessings He gives you. But at the end, you're going to stand before the King of Kings, the one who hung on that cross. But He won't be your Savior. He'll be your judge. And He's going to say what it is He wants to say to everybody. Come, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Come home. And if we can focus on that, it can make some of the difficult moments between now and then more bearable. It'll cause us in those moments when we want to give up to not. All right, I got about two minutes to deal with Hebrews chapter 12. Let's, uh, let's get to that. We have the, the discipline of discipleship, and I just want to kind of walk through this. There are two types of discipline that are under view in this section. Um, and it's, this is verse 1 through 17. Uh, there is, we have to discipline ourselves, but we also have God disciplining us. So the first type of discipline is the self-discipline that results from our own faith. You go back to verse 1 through 3, and he says, You see you have this cloud of witnesses that are around you. Um, lay aside every weight, that is, maybe the burdens, and the sin that so easily entangles you, the sin problems that are, are, are your flesh is fighting with. Look at Jesus. So that's discipline, isn't it? So hard to, to find Jesus sometimes when we're going through the, the daily struggles of life. And he says, consider, we'll say more about this in the sermon today, consider him who endured such hostility of sinners against himself. So all of this is what they do to, to themselves. It's an exertion that they're putting on themselves. Self-discipline. But also notice in verse 5 through 11 that there's the discipline that comes from the Father. And what I want us to notice with that is that what he says about that discipline he uses that word six times from verse 5 through 11. He says, first of all, that we are to value it. When God causes you to be refined in the refinery of affliction, opposition, whatever it is, he says, don't despise it, cherish it. Because of what Harold says, you can appreciate what God's given you. Number two, we're to recognize it as proof of his love. What? We had... Three sons, and they were all boys. And I used to joke about this, that Gary got in trouble for what he said, Dale got in trouble for what he did, and Carl got in trouble for how he acted, his attitude. I mean, it's, you could just write it down nine times out of ten. You remember when they get like one year old and two years old, and, and they're starting to get independent? Uh, maybe this is falling out of favor with some, but you know... There's, they're maybe trying to reach for something that's not theirs, or, or maybe they're trying to get into something. Maybe they, you know, you see that moment where they, they get it. They're testing you, and you say no. What do they do? You know? What do you do in that moment if you love them? You discipline them. Now, I ain't trying to tell you how to parent. But make sure they get the message, right? Discipline them. And this is not about parental discipline. This is about understanding what the Hebrews writer is saying here. He's saying that when God disciplines you, don't think it's hatred or disapproval. It is because He loves you that He's allowing this to happen. Man, that's important. If we get that, it revolutionizes our relationship with God and it may impact our, even our parenting. It's meant to help us to endure. And so the, the tough stuff that God allows to happen in our lives is so that it builds some spiritual calluses, not on our heart, but on our, our spiritual hands. And it's an indication that God is our Father. You know, I, I, think I, made, I preached about discipline not that long ago, um, and I love kids, but I'm not going to go spank a stranger's kid. It's not my responsibility, not my circus, not my monkeys, right? So that's not for me. 
But as a father, maybe a little bit as a grandfather, you know, I, I, I have maybe a little bit more of an entitlement, especially with the kids. And what the Hebrews writer is saying is, is that God disciplines as a sign of the, the relationship, the paternal relationship. He is our Heavenly Father. Don't despise it because He's doing this because of how much He cares about you. And then he moves on and he says that we, what grows out of this, and this is kind of toward the end of that section, is that as we grab that and as we're striving, not perfectly, Galatians 6 and verse 1, but we try to help those that are weak and who are struggling and who are sagging. That's what he's saying there in verses 12 through 14. So we discipline ourselves, God disciplines us, and then we are gentle tools in the hands of God to discipline those who may be in this audience who are, are falling away. So here's the bottom line. I'll end with this. The author doesn't want us to be spiritual descendants of Esau. Esau despised the gifts that God had given to him. He fell away. Esau are the unfaithful Christians uh, who have left the church, at least as an analogy. And he's saying, I don't want any of you to be that because it didn't end well for Esau. All right. The end of the other is Mount Sinai, Mount Zion. We have a better kingdom than they did. And then you can go right into chapter... 13. All right. Thank you very much for your attention.